Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as already said, I'm talking about this research project today. So this is the title. Um, again, it is very long. I will not read it out again. Um, but this is a project which is funded by the city of Vienna and is currently being carried out at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage. So first, let me introduce you to the textual material that is under investigation here, namely the so-called arrival lists. Um, and one of which of them is shown here on the left. So these lists were published twice a week in the Austrian newspaper Wienerisches Diarium from 1703 to 1725, where the publishers had access to them through an imperial privilege. These texts document the arrival of upper class persons, for instance, aristocrats, um, persons with military functions or clerics. Hereby, each list entry includes various information, namely not only on the arriving persons themselves, like their name, their um, occupation, their affiliation, or so on, but also on the temporal and spatial um, information on their travel route, like their date of arrival, their point of entry, so which city gate they used to enter the city of Vienna, their point of departure, and even their place of accommodation within Vienna. And the goal of the project now is to utilize this semantic density with the help of semi-automatic digital methods. And here in practice, this is done through a four-step workflow. So first, reliable full texts are created as a central foundation for all further analysis. Then secondly, this full text basis is semantically enriched through named entity recognition processes. And thirdly, the data can then subsequently be mapped on historical city plans of Vienna. As already mentioned, this project is currently still ongoing as most projects presented today. And this is the step we are currently working on most. So I will mostly talk about insights from the first two steps, but I will also give a first um, glimpse into preliminary findings. So also as a last step, all data that we are creating will be published online and will be archived in the long time repository of our institute. So it can be reused in future research. So let's take a closer look at the methodological approach. For layered analysis and text recognition, we use Transcribus, concretely the publicly available um, HDR model, um, German Fraktur 18th century, Wienerisches Diarium M9, which was created by Reschen Kamkaska. Since this model was trained on the 18th century Wiener Zeitung and has a very low character, er er character error rate of 0.8%, it offers an ideal fit for text recognition of the arrival lists. And then in addition, we also included a phase of manual inspection and correction to really ensure the utmost accuracy of all transcriptions. Because of course, being able to work on reliable full text is a fundamental basis for all NLP tasks. This is especially true for named entity recognition processes, which operate at the token level and can, for instance, be impaired for, by poor OCR quality. Still, of course, even if we now have reliable full texts, historical newspaper texts tend to pose a challenge for named entity recognition, for instance, due to their high graphematical variation, but also other non-standard features. So hence, within the project, we explored various approaches. For instance, we used existing models for historical German. We um, tested a rule-based pipeline, or we deployed large language models. And in the end, the best results were reached through using GPT 3.5, which we accessed through the OpenAI um, Open API in combination with the Python library Promptify. With Promptify, users can define multiple parameters for their named entity um, recognition task, like the domain of the texts, annotated examples, and the labels to be given. So in our case, a one-shot approach was taken, where we gave the model one exemplary annotated arrival list with nine items, so very few examples. Um, and also, as can be seen in the code snippet on the, um, on the bottom here, we also set the German labels in close accordance to the internal structure of the arrival lists. So we differentiated between person, city gate, date, prior location, place of accommodation, and destination. And then further, currently, a second stage is also being integrated into the workflow, where the information given per person is again differentiated into further um, subcategories, like first name, last name, title, occupation, and so on. Um, so what are the potentials of using this approach? Um, one helpful aspect was clearly the choice of labels, the free choice of labels in comparison to fixed categories of pre-trained models, which allows for highly specialized categories that mirror the structure of our textual material. Also, the, since the arrivalists show a relatively consistent structure over time, um, using a one-shot approach, um, on, which only uses a very few examples, offers a practical and efficient solution. So these two seem to be the crucial reasons why this approach worked best for us and proved to be highly efficient for the semi-structured um, 
arrival lists. So to give you a first impression of how efficient it worked in the end, a first um, systematic evaluation with a small time distributed goal standard of um, 10 randomly selected arrival lists, so with around 80 list entries, um, resulted in an F1 score of 0 0.99. Of course, um, further tests are surely needed here. This is only a small sample, but these first results are quite impressive and they enable extensive quantitative analysis on the arrival list's contents. So as an output of step two, in addition to the full text and metadata, we have now gained comprehensive structured data on multiple arrival lists. Currently, this data set consists of almost 40,000 ent entities identified within over 1,400 lists. And I will now show you a few first findings from this data. So one thing we can see is that the investigated arrival lists vary between one to 15 entries with four to eight persons listed per newspaper being the most common values. So this means per week, approximately six to 18 arrivals of upper class persons were documented. Of course, among all these arrivals, um, travelers, there were also travelers who entered Vienna several times in the early 18th century. One such person who appears multiple times is Prince Eugene of Savoy, for whom 13 arrivals between August 1703 and March 1725 were documented. And as you can see from the figures given on the slide here, he was documented at the gates of Vienna once a year between 1703 and 1708, but also from time to time in later years. And he reached the city from various points of departure, among them being Hamburg, Hannover, Milano, Prague, or Leutschau. What is interesting is that Prince Eugene is not only mentioned as an arriving person, but he's also mentioned 19, 19 times as a point of departure, 10 times as a place of accommodation, and a full 58 times as a destination. So the arrival lists show us that Prince Eugene frequently functioned as a host and as a cause for travelers to actually visit Vienna. So hereby, this is giving us insights into various socio-cultural roles he took on in his lifetime and also his social connections. Another rather linguistic insight now we can gain from the arrival list is quantitative knowledge about graphematical variation in early modern newspaper texts. Notably, there are six different city gates in Vienna at the time of, this, um, at, of our research, but we find 93 different uh, types of variants when we look at the entity city gate. For instance, for the so-called Kärntner Tor, um, which is shown here on the left, we have found 37 writing variants so far. Some of them are shown here on the slide. So you can see this is a high graphematical variation within this material. Still, when normalizing these spelling variants, we are able to trace the use of different city gates over time. And um, three um, tendencies can be identified in this regards, besides the fact, of course, that for the year 1715, there are, um, we have little data at this point currently. But what we can see is that first, the Kärntner Tor was used at all times by far the most frequently by upper class persons, possibly because it could, for an additional fee, also be crossed during the night. Um, the gate with the second most entries in comparison is changing over time. At the beginning of our period of study, it's the Roten Turmtor, which is located next to the Danube. Um, and then, but towards 1719, this position is overtaken by the relatively close by Stubentor. In contrast, Schottentor, Neutor, and Burgtor were only rarely used by upper class visitors. So you can see this here um, visualized on the St um, Steinhausen plan, a map of Vienna from 1710. And you can see in total the upper class used the gates in the southeast much more often than they used the gates in the northwest of the city. So now that we have a, gotten a rough understanding of where upper classes um, entered the city, another question might come up is where did they then stay? So looking at the entity category place of accommodation, the analyzed arrival lists contain over 3,000 different types or undeduplicated entities. And here by the three most named types are Wilden Mann, which is an inn, to, um, then Seinem Haus, which can be translated to his house, and Matschakerhof, which is another inn. So what we can already see from this is that arriving individuals were not necessarily foreign visitors, but also persons with a permanent residence inside Vienna. However, this at the same time seems to be a minor group since after taking into account all writing variants, we can see that only 9% of all visitors stay in their own homes. For the majority, which are staying in inns or other places, the Inn Wildermann, which can be seen here on the right, is by far the most popular choice. As it is named in 900, sorry, 
in 980 um, different um, items, and it accounts for 10% of all lodgings, so a very high ratio here. Um, in comparison, on the second place, there's the Matschakerhof, which only accounts for th 313 stays, or 3% of all lodgings. So also on the level of lodging choices, the arrival lists can provide us with valuable insights into early modern Vienna. So hopefully these exemplary findings have shown you that the arrival texts, arrival lists, although they are relatively small texts, constitute a very rich data set, and they lend themselves to a variety of possible research questions. To further expand this potential, we are now currently carrying out data cleaning and enrichment, which includes normalization, um, deduplication, disambiguation, and we are also geocoding the toponyms that you have seen so far. Um, and this, um, this way, the collected data can subsequently be mapped on the historical city maps of Vienna and be um, analyzed using GIS methods to really get a deeper understanding of the mobility in and outside 18th century Vienna. And really, in the end, to contribute to the overarching idea of a Vienna time machine where persons, places, and events are connected on both a spatial and a temporal level. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you.